Welcome into this Five Clubs conversation. I'm Gary Williams. We are really on the doorstep of the first men's major of 2022. When you think about televised golf over the course of your lifetime, however old you may be, if you're 25, 45, 75, who is the voice and soundtrack of golf on television? It's Jim Nance. Well, Jim is going to be joining me here in a second. If you consider his career for somebody who aspired to play college golf, and he did modestly at the University of Houston, of course, famously uh, was teammates with, with Fred Couples. He's somebody who embarked upon a television career, and it's turned into being one of the great Hall of Fame broadcasting careers that we have seen in the television medium. And he said a couple of years ago that his aspiration was to call 50 Masters. Well, he's kind of amended that. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about all of the memories of being at Augusta National starting in 1986. Pretty good year uh, to be baptized into television and the Masters with Nicholas shooting 65 on Sunday. And of course, a lot of people, whether you are a broadcaster or just a fan, envious of this time of the year and his job. Because he will go from calling the national championship game on a Monday night and on Tuesday morning, he will head to Augusta National. Our Five Clubs conversation with Jim Nance is coming up. With that, we, we bring in Jim Nance from CBS Sports. He's getting ready for number 37. <laughs> really remarkable. And that, of course, being uh, the anchor and the host of the Masters Tournament on CBS. Jim, it's so good to see you. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well. I had to laugh when you said that, 37. If, when somebody says that, it just kind of struck me. That's a big number. Uh, there's a lot of gratitude that goes into that number, uh, 37 visits to to Augusta and to that tournament is very special, but it's very special to be with you. Uh, you're a wonderful friend and a great credit to the game and important, very important and trusted voice in the game. So uh, I really appreciate being with you, Gary, and having me on. Well, Jim, you know, I was saying right before I brought you on that, that whether you're a broadcaster or a fan, there's, there's a level of appreciation and maybe a tone of envy for you this time of the year, because the Nance two-step from the Final Four to Augusta National is is one of the great dance moves in in broadcast history. Do you have a do you have a, a little tradition of your own in terms of whatever the Final Four site may be uh, when you when you when you put a bow on a Final Four in a national championship game and turn your attention to Augusta? Are there certain things you always do? Well, that's no one has ever asked me that. I do have a ritual, and it comes on Monday night after the game ends and uh, I leave the courtside broadcast set up and present the trophy to the winning team. And, and I throw it back to the studio guys and we all wait for one shining moment to be played across the nation. And it plays inside the arena. And that's a moment that I share with my oldest daughter, Caroline, she'll be there in new Orleans again this year. And uh, we're arm in arm and we watch it come down together. And it's been that way since she was a little girl and, is something that's very important to, to both of us that we share that moment. That as you watch this whole kaleidoscope of the tournament go by with all those images and that that wonderful little soundtrack that uh, has been a part of the tournament since the first time it played in 1987. I led to it, actually, in 87. I was the host. And we were, in fact, in the Superdome in New Orleans. And I led Absolutely. to this thing called One Shining Moment. Keith Smart had just hit the shot to win it for Indiana. <laughs> And Musburger was calling the game with Billy Packer and Brent threw it back over to me. And I was, this was my second, my second final four. So I was 27 years old and there was some copy, you know, they kind of wanted me to keep to. And uh, I introduced it for the first time that Dave Barrett has put together a song about this year's tournament. It's called One Shining Moment and for all of us at CBS Sports. It's a good night from New Orleans. And they rolled it and it's been rolling ever since. And um, now I watch it with my daughter, and uh, I have to admit, there's a little tear in the eye as, uh, as I say goodbye to that. I need some closure, Gary. I think that's the point. I need to close 
that chapter, that last exhilarating month that I have absolutely loved and treasured every moment of it. But now I've got to let go of the tournament because in a matter of hours, I'm landing in Augusta and it's time for the Masters. You know, I, I know this because you've talked about this in the past. You know, there are a lot of college basketball coaches who love golf. It's it's a good release for them. Uh, but the guy, one of the guys you work with, I know, I know Grant has has an interest in golf, but it's not like Raft. I mean, Bill is a member of one of the great clubs in America in, in Baltusrol. How much, how many questions do you get about Augusta National, about professional golf <laughs> along the way during the month of March? Because they all know where you're going. Yeah. It's all upside down. I'm not going to kid you. Again, you've tapped into my brain a little bit, and no one's thought to ask me this before, but on the road to the Final Four, I am constantly asked about the Masters, and it could be in a sit-down with a coach getting ready for a game, and I'm there presumably to get some information, behind-the-scenes information, tell, tell the story uh, and, and their journey to the Final Four, but they want to talk to me about the Masters. So I have to try to politely segue out of that. What's it like? How many years? Who's going to win? How I would love to go there someday. And I mean, I love talking about the Masters. 365, I truly do end up getting asked about it every single day. But during the NCAA tournament, I get asked about it out on the basketball circuit constantly. And then here's the flip of it. Now I come off the championship game, say goodbye with one shining moment with my daughter, Caroline. And now I go to Augusta. And all the players, I'm trying to round up some little nuggets before the, the competition begins. And they all want to talk to me about the basketball tournament. <laughs> what was it like? What's this guy like? What's Scott Drew like? What was it like being on Coach K's final journey? So they never quite, they're, they're out of sync. We're talking golf during the tournament, during the NCAA tournament. We're talking basketball at the start of the Masters. But you know what? I love it. I mean, I just feel so blessed and fortunate. I filled with my heart with so much gratitude to be able to to be able to call both of those great events. I know that, the, I know you mean that wholeheartedly. You know, for us, and we're of a similar vintage, I, I always thought, and I love the Masters from my first impressions of it in the, in the early 70s, but the U.S. Open, to me, had a, had a stature that, that I, I really, it almost seemed, you know, P.J. Boatwright and these figures that were part of the USGA. And I went to the U.S. Open, my first one in 1980 at Baltusrol. I actually followed Weisskopf in the first round. Because my dad said, Gary, yeah. <laughs> he said, Gary, you're not going to see Nicholas. You won't be able to see a shot. He said, why don't we follow Fuzzy and Weisskopf? Fuzzy had won the Masters in 79. And my dad was so dialed into what was what was right for me to be able to get a good experience. Of course, Tom shoots 63 and Jack was about four groups behind him and he missed a short putt to shoot 62. But my point is, and that's that the U S open is not still what it is, but the masters has, has captured something Jim over the last quarter century that I'm not exactly sure how to describe how they've achieved it. You're so close to it going back there in the, the intimate nature that you do how have they done it? Well, I agree with what you're saying here. I totally believe that the profile of the Masters has has soared here um, in the last, you, you, you say in the last 25 years, maybe that is the timeline. And it's become something that triggers uh, an emotion in people, whether they're a golf fan or not. And there are people that just have now related that tournament and that experience to like the finest sporting event in the world. It has... It has a reputation, uh, an aura about it that it's almost mystical. You know, like if you haven't been there before, they people are. What is that? Is that a, is that real? What is that thing out there in Augusta? And I, I don't know what to to, to tr attribute that to, but it's funny. I just was lost in a moment there, thinking about you following. Tom Weiskopf. I was a huge Tom Weiskopf fan as a kid, so I can remember that opening day when Tom and Jack both shot uh, 63. And of course, you know, you got to see that was an epic win by Jack is back at, at Baltus Raw in 80. My, my first major championship experience came in the U.S. Open in 1974. It was Father's Day, wow. 15 years old. And my uh, my dad took us from our home at the time in Colts Neck, New Jersey. And, mm -hmm. and we went to, to, to uh, Wingfoot. 
I, I was, again, a huge Weisskopf fan as a kid. I'm a huge Weisskopf fan at this very moment in my life. And I'm so happy that Tom is doing so well. Yes. In his recovery. Yep. I'm very touched by by the fight and and the way that he's been able to to, to bounce back from a very serious bout with cancer. Uh, but I, I, I went to that final round uh, when Hale won, mm -hmm. but I started the day by following Tom. And wherever Tom was playing, I wanted to be there. I just, there was a certain way that he carried himself, his golf swing, um, his posture was, was, it was just something very regal about Tom. his dress. Dress, he wore yeah. the most spectacular cashmere sweaters. I mean, oh, yeah. He had style. There's no question. And uh, I was all in. My parents didn't have the resources to make this, like, automatic by any means. But since I was a little boy, they took me to one tour event a year because they knew I was hopelessly in love with golf. So usually it married up with our spring break schedule. Again, living in New Jersey. So on one given year, that that week, that spring break week, could match up with the Jackie Gleason Inverary Classic. That <laughs> that meant the family was going to Fort Lauderdale. One year it might be the old Jacksonville Open. This was long before the days of the players. We would go to Jacksonville. It might be the week of Doral. We we went to Miami. I had a, a, one sibling, a sister's two years older, and I think maybe she had to have been a little frustrated that. Where were we going to go on spring break? It was going to be so that little Jimmy could go run around and watch a PGA Tour event for a couple of days. But my parents, God bless them, they would put us in a car. It would take us two days to drive there. We didn't fly. We didn't have the means to fly. We would drive. We'd usually stop and see some family in North Carolina. And we would overnight. And then we would drive on to Florida. So it was four days of our vacation was in a car. And it was all... Uh, predicated on where the PGA tour is going to be so that I had the chance to romp around the blue monster and follow Tom Weisskopf. You know, I think about that. I feel so, I mean, I'm just so grateful that my life um, has taken me on this journey. I mean, these are all dreams born out of a young boy with a vast imagination that again, I was so hopelessly in love with the PGA tour and my family made that kind of effort to, to expose me to it and that I would end up later in life, you know, 15 to 20 weeks a year, actually nice. being there. That's who's speaking on Saturdays and Sundays when I'm calling a golf tournament. That, that really truly is. You, 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 people could have, uh, you could have a basketball board. Here's my board from Michigan State and, and uh, well, I can't, it's not focused. Yeah, you, you, you yeah. had you had a beauty. For you. you can have all these boards and all that in front of you. Yep. You call it a football game or a basketball game. You call it a golf tournament. This is the board right here. That, that's where it comes from. And the guy that's feeling a lot of gratitude, who is trying to be the observer for the folks at home, what's leaving the lips and what's in my mind is that same boy that was running around. Life was good running around watching these PGA Tour players and uh, being right in the middle of it. You know, Jim, it, it you know, the Weisskopf thing, I, I, it, it takes me to 86, which was your first year. They've stationed you on 16, and you had gone there prior. It was the experience where you played the golf course for the first time because you were going to lay down some tracks um, in advance. Cherkinian told you you're going to play golf. You're I, I don't have clubs. I don't have clothes. He equipped you, you got to 13, and then he pulled you off the oh, golf course. True. And but but here you come on Sunday, and here's Jack doing what he's doing. And as the momentum is building, he's heading towards your hole. And he makes a putt on 15, and here he is standing on 16, and it's real now. And and Seve, you know, it hit the ball in the he hadn't hit it in the water on 15 yet, because Jack got to 17 T. But the interlude with you and of all people, with Weisskopf, because Jack backed off. Jim, I mean, why does it, why did that happen? I mean, <laughs> think about that. Well, it's pretty neat that you actually know that story, Gary. Only you. Um, the moment was so big. You're talking about the moment that Jack's standing on the yes. 16 coming off of Eagle. I'm 26 years old. I'm less than four years removed from graduation at the University of Houston. And since I was 11, I've made these 
crazy declarations that the the dream was to one day work for CBS. CBS broadcast the Masters tournament. I wanted to be one of those voices. Had nothing to do with wanting to be on television. I just was mesmerized by the voices of my youth who were telling me the story at home and had all of this knowledge. I was just completely enraptured by all of that. So yeah, now here I am at my first Masters and Jack's just made Eagle. And I, I am... I can honestly tap into the anxiety that I felt at the moment. They actually, there was a, a little break in there when Jack uh, was making his way short steps from 15 to 16. The Trichinian said in my headset, um, and again, he was the father of golf television and he was known as the Ayatollah because he was tough and he did tough love me. And he had a lot of goals for me in my career, which I've always tried to live up to. He's been gone since 2011 to the World Golf Hall of Fame. I get to be his presenter, as fate would have it. But um, he was a great leader because he knew when to yell and bark and motivate and inspire. And he also knew how to also talk to a 26-year-old kid who might be a little over his skis at a moment like that. Mm -hmm. He whispered so gently into my headset that it was really not much more than a whisper. And people don't think about Frank ever whispering, but it, 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 it was almost uh, hypnotic. And he said, Jimmy, Jimmy, listen, son, we're coming to you here in a minute with Jack. You can handle this. I know you can. You've prepared your whole life for this and you're going to be fine. Just remember, you don't have to say too much. This is a visual medium. You'll be fine. You've got Weisskopf down at the tower if you need somebody to talk to, because you're out there alone. And uh, do great, son. That's the way he was always kind of... He was a big grammarian, so he would sometimes have fun ways of twisting little phrases that were off just to try to get your attention. You'll do great. Instead of you'll do well. And anyway, the moment arrives and Jack's trying to figure out how he wants to play the shot. He's got Jackie on the bag. And then suddenly he backed off the shot, threw some grass up in the air. I had already dispensed with the information that I had in my head and my heart that this was a pivotal hole in Jack's career at Augusta. Going back to 63 when when he won the Masters for the first time and made a pivotal uh, birdie there. And, of course, the epic Weisskopf, Johnny Miller, Jack Nicholas triumvirate, and what had happened back in the 70s with them and the, the great birdie up the hill when it was a rare Sunday back right hole location. And uh, Henry Longhurst had that call. So I'd already gone through all that. And now it, it, he's resetting. I've got nowhere to go. Plus, I don't want to over talk it. I just, what more can I say? So I remembered that Frank had whispered in my ear, bring in Weisskopf if you have to. So Tom was actually down in the cabin working with Brent Musburger. Brent had brought us on the air and would do the green jacket ceremony. So I said, Tom Weisskopf, you know Jack Nicholas as well as anyone in the world. What is going through Jack Nicholas's mind? at a moment like this. And he said, Jim, if I knew what was going on inside of Jack Nicholas's brain, I might've won this thing two or three times myself. <laughs> Which is, to this day, it's one of the great lines of all time. Of all time. Of all time. And yeah, the fact that I'm interacting with Tom, it's intimidating. I'm not going to kid you. I mean, I still couldn't believe it. It was a colleague of all these guys. Uh, the fact that <laughs> I'm actually on a journey where life has taken me to, to take instruction from Frank Trichinian, to be in the broadcast, uh, embedded in a broadcast with the likes of Pat Summerall and Ken Venturi, have Frank Trichinian again leading the orchestra. So and now I've got Tom Weiskopf. I had marched in his gallery so many times in so many places. My parents had gone to all ends of the earth, had gone through um, probably an expense that they didn't have to be able to expose their son to the PGA tour uh, because that's what he was in love with. 
And uh, now I'm communicating on the air like I'm a grown up. Yeah, it was a big moment, a big moment. I'm, I'm 62 now. I was 26 then. I don't know how. I'm not trying to give myself credit. I'm just, I, I can feel anxiety thinking about a 26 year old version of me Whew. trying to stand in there at that moment and, and have the broadcast, you know, at your hole in, in your hands, so to speak, take it to the direction, um, as far as a narrative goes, any which way you want. And yeah, now I'm on the air communicating with Tom Weisskopf and we all know that Jack, um, Ended up hitting a shot that um, came off the slope and started making its way toward the hole and uh, almost looked like it took a peek at the hole before it settled about three, three and a half feet below the cup. Perfect little uphill putt for the birdie that he would hold. And Frank just had a great sense of drama. He was a, he was a drama major at Penn. This was a, highly intelligent and educated uh, man and Frank Trichinian and his sense of where to be um, it was brilliant and he knew he couldn't cut off a jack so other action was going on you, you said he had Seve was in the mix Greg was in the mix Tom Kite was in the mix Frank stayed with with Jack walking along the water's edge up to the 16th green to that ovation that wouldn't end and never cut away and thankfully, I had enough of a sixth sense and enough mentoring from Frank to know that I'm not saying anything over that moment of him, that elongated moment of him walking up to 16. So anyway, it's one of the sweetest moments of my life, Gary, the more I think about it now that I have, you know, years and years and the chance to reflect on it. And you've uh, lured me into this uh, trans-like uh, <laughs> wonderful memory in my head. Um what a blessing to be there for that and the people that I got to interact with and to be able to sit on that moment of history when, when Jack would hold the putt and tie the lead. You know, Jim, these, these, these odd threads that happen in golf and, and look where, where Jack was in his life and where Tiger was in 2019, uh, they got to those places. Their, their route on the journey was different. Uh, the one odd little note was that they were both 33rd in the world. Now that the World Golf Hall of Fame ranking in 86 was new. That was the first year of it. And Jack just happened to fall. He was 33rd going into the week. And, and oddly, in 2019, Tiger was 33rd in the world uh, that week a couple of years ago. Now, I, I'm sharing this with you because you'll appreciate it. This little leather-bound notebook has every shot Tiger struck on that Sunday, all 70 blows. I walked every step. At a producer at Golf Channel, Ben Dawn, who's going to drive back to Orlando after doing live from that morning because they'd moved up the times and they'd split the tees and he was going off with Tony and, and Francesco. And I said, don't leave. I said, walk with me. And, and after the fifth hole, Tiger had bogeyed four and five. He said, I'm leaving. I said, don't leave. I don't know that he's going to win, but don't leave. We stood behind the 18th green in place for 18 minutes because of the crowd control. I've got all 70 shots. Time stamp, wind direction, his relation to the lead in this little leather bound notebook. It's one of the great moments, days of, of my life. I, I went to Sage Valley that night by myself and drove out on the golf course and just sat there and reflected on what I had seen. And, and, you know, it was generations of people coming together, almost trying to pull this guy across the line. And you're calling it. Take me through. You're, you're just where you're intellectually where you were and emotionally where you were as that day progressed because it was early in the day. It was a nine o'clock broadcast start. And uh, we had uh, all that impending weather, which really never materialized to any nope. degree. By the way, the, the nugget there on 33rd in the world, that's the first time I've heard it. You know, I think I've heard everything and uh, that's that's pretty cool i never knew that they, they they share that symmetry that's amazing um they also share the fact that april 13th has been good to them both that was jack in 86 was on that date and tiger in 97 was an april 13th win but that day uh three years ago not that i was underestimating tiger but i just didn't think that the field was jam-packed at the top. 
And yes, he was right in the middle of the mix, but I wasn't sure that he was that far back. Uh, I didn't dismiss him, but it wasn't until, and you said he had a bumpy stretch there on the front side, but when things went haywire down at 12, it, it, it suddenly just, it just hit us all. He's going to win this thing. He's, he, he is actually going to figure out a way to get it to the finish line. This year, by the way, will be the first time I believe that we've been back to the Masters in some respects. Sure, we've been back. We had magnificent effort by the club to stage the yep. 2020 version. I don't know how they pulled that off. They picked the right date. They got the right champion in Dustin. And last year to have the Hideki win was great for the game, and I loved it. Uh, but this is the first time we're going to have full house and everything's going to look like it did back in 2019. That's a long time ago. Uh, I'm excited about just feeling it like it had been all those years where you never could have imagined it would be interrupted or altered in some capacity to be anything other than the way we know the masters to be with tens of thousands of patrons ringing every green, the roars and all that. I mean, we just haven't really truly been there since that, that uh, epic day for Tiger in 2019. But as he came up 18, all he needed was a five to win. And there's a moment there that I, I've just, I've always been transfixed on. And that is Steve Milton, our director, cut to a shot behind the green. And th there was the family. You saw, you, you, you saw the two kids were waiting for their father. The last time I had checked in with Steiny that week, I had heard there was a soccer game conflict for Sam and they wouldn't be coming. So I didn't know that. So it, 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 it was surprising. And it instantly put in my head the symmetry from mm -hmm. 19 to what's about to happen to back to 1997. And I was just struck emotionally with, this is bigger than him making it all the way back. To, to the top of his game. I mean, that's just gigantic in its own right. But to see him now as a father, and you know, when you're out on the tour, you, you hear all about what's going on in people's lives. You don't always report it. And a lot of that stuff doesn't need to be reported. But, you know, I had heard all about the dedication of Tiger as a father. Um, uh, being in the carpool lane, going to all the, all the ball games, uh, picking up his kids, dropping them off at school, and how you know devoted he was. And you know, it's hey, as a dad, it's it's just great to hear. But when I saw the two kids and just the eagerness to see their dad win and take the take the tournament, something that I could only again imagine how much it meant to him for them to be able to see what his dad used to do on a regular basis. It just was a it was really emotional. Um Sometimes people knock me for being a little too syrupy or too emotional, but that's just who I am. You know, I can't apologize for what's in my DNA. It's just the way I look at the world. Some people don't have the ability to quite get as nostalgic or sentimental or don't want to be, uh, but that's just who I am. So I, I knew that we were about to see, barring anything other than a five, um, we were about to see an, just an incredible finish here. And it's, it certainly was, I mean, it, I didn't know what I was going to say. I got asked that the other day. What do you, you know, how long ago, how far back did you go thinking about the return to glory is what I said over the last Yeah. Month. Yep. Well, 97, when he won and I called it uh, a win for the ages, uh, you know, I had all Saturday night to have in my head, what I was going to do over that important last <laughs> nice. oh, got a nine shot lead. You better believe I'm going to be thinking about how that whole last putt is going to play out i didn't want to just kind of mindlessly go after it I mean, he's going to win and he's going to break every record and this was a moment that transcended the sport so i i, I had to be prepared for it and i was proud that i was prepared for it because i knew that that narrative in 97 would um would um, outlive us all i mean that that clip's going to be played back till the end of time and so will 19 now as it turns out so but in 19 i didn't know he's going to win but i saw glory in front of me on my monitor, I saw that shot of uh, two loving children waiting for their dad. And I just thought about how great it is for him as a dad, you know, as a, as a man who's been on a, 
uh, a long journey. He's been in a fishbowl uh, as a public figure since he was two years old, and his whole world has pretty much been exposed. Um, and but we hadn't seen uh, that many windows into that relationship with his children, and we were going to see it shortly. And I just thought of the word glory, Gary, glory. I don't know how I was going to put it in some sort of sentence structure, but when he stood over the putt, I mean, I, at that very moment, I knew I was going to say something with glory and knocked it in. And it just, it felt like to me, the return to glory. And that's how that came out kind of at that moment. And, and Jim, I also think you mentioned how it was stacked up. I think it was right that the entire generation that he had spawned, who had all been inspired to play the game, they all wanted to see this. They all wanted to be a part of like, I, 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 want, I want a piece of him when he is not necessarily, not 2000, but they got to experience the gravity and the weight of him being back. And it was, it was Kepke, it was DJ, it was Cantlay, it was Shoffley, it was Finau. It was all these guys who were inspired to play the game who, who were pulled into that vortex on that Sunday to, 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 to see it all. And, and I, I thought that that made it even, even more poignant and more powerful. Now I'm going to, I know you've got obligations, so I'm going to, I've got these five quick questions. I'm going to let you go on this. Um, tell me the golf course you've never played that you're motivated to get to. This is going to sound crazy. I've never played the old course. Oh my God. I know. And I'm a member of the RNA and I've been there for every open championship since 2000. And I, I walk it, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a member of the gallery there. and one of the patrons. I've, I've walked it every day. I'm back to again, being that little boy that's running around Doral or in Brary, whatever it might be. And that's what I do for fun. I'm going to do it again this summer, but I've never hit a golf ball at St. Andrews. Uh, I should <laughs> laugh. I mean, there's no reason why I should be entitled to play there, but I've never, I've never played. And that's, that, that's a pretty easy one to answer. Uh, I feel like I've played it in my, in my mind. Um, but I, I'm looking forward to that day. You want to go? You better believe it. I, my <laughs> wife asked me, on my before my 50th birthday she said what do you want i said I, I don't want anything she said no no what do you want i said i want to walk over that bridge again the first time i'd walked over it was with my dad and i said i want to walk over that bridge again and that's where i was on my 50th birthday wow um, that's all yeah i know yep. about your your famous father-son trips which i think is just as good as it gets i've walked over the bridge because i've been there en enough times when wasn't a tournament going on and i've stayed uh, right there at uh, Rusak's hotel and the old yep. and um, the old course hotel. Um, I have a friend of mine, Dave Reniker, who's past club champion at Bel Air Country Club, and he's a big St. Andrews guy. He's actually taken sabbaticals there and stayed there for two or three months. And he says, if I ever, ever hear that you played St. Andrews for the first time without me, we I will never speak to you again. <laughs> so that, that's it. Our, our friendship is over. So I'm bringing somebody with me. But um, that's yeah, you, I'll, yeah, I'll, you'll I'll do love it. to be in that group with you someday. Dave's with me for sure. Absolutely. All right. Give me the sporting event you've never attended that you want to. There isn't one. There isn't one. I don't I don't long for anything. I'm grateful for okay. everything. OK. And you know, I, I, I just count my blessings. I don't I again, I don't I don't I'm not envious. I don't have uh, any longing in my heart. I just have gratitude. So, OK. Uh, Give me, give me the current player who you think will be a good broadcaster five years from now, 20 years from now. Mm. Give me a guy whose mind is curious and, he, and you think he's equipped uh, to, to call the game and analyze the game. Who would it be? I think there are many, by the way. I think there are a lot who would be really highly qualified to do it. Um, I think it'd be really cool if Tiger wanted to do it someday. Mm. Uh, I don't think... He will. I actually feel quite certain he would never want to do that. Jack did it, and I thought he was great. When yeah. Jack would dive into that ABC booth, gosh, I thought he was he was fabulous. That yeah, if he did it, I'm with you. I'm I'm not sure that he would be motivated. All right, I'll give you two guys though. Okay. Okay. I think that um, 
My boy, Freddie Couples, would be really good at it. He's honed his craft uh, on Sirius Radio. He's going to yep. play the show. And um, I think that he has a lot of opinions. He's a huge sports fan. He kind of understands the rhythm and flow and the cadence of a broadcast now. And um, I don't know that his back would allow him to travel like that. I think he'd be very good. Brant Snedeker. Yes. Super smart guy. And uh, he has great credentials and Ryder Cupper and wins on some of the best golf courses uh, that the PGA Tour has to offer is contended at the Open. He's had a 54-hole lead at the Master. I think he'd be very good, but there's so many. There's so many that would be outstanding. All right, the first time you played the hole you were married on? Seventh hole at, at, at Pebble Beach. I don't have a vivid memory of the first time I played it. Okay. It would have been, well, I, I know I played with my father, that day that's who i was with uh, i, I played it with my dad and it was it was in 19 it was in well actually i i actually played it with amy alcott in 88 the, the pebble beach wow. company had us do a video of um hole by hole of of playing pebble beach and uh it took like three days to move the cameras around but we're hitting multiple shots but the day after the 90 um crosby at&t uh I, I got to play with with my dad, and, and it was special. I played it obviously many times since, and that single spot, being on that tee at Pebble, that is, if I had to pick one piece of turf on the planet, as it rotates around and all this stuff, it you, you end up at that same spot. That that is that is my heaven on earth. Uh, you mentioned your dad. I'm going to end you with this. You you wrote that fabulous book always by my side Thank you. um it, your your dad um if you could play one round with him anywhere would it be pebble uh we did that so i probably would say cypress point we never did that one okay i, I would i would love to be able to play golf with my dad anywhere anywhere it doesn't have to be one of the legendary courses of the world um the last thing I did with my dad, and the last time that there, there was a moment where his eyes were open, as you know, he, he lost a long battle to Alzheimer's. So his ability to understand what I was saying, it, it wouldn't have been there. And at least you hope, you hope and hope there were some synapses that somehow were activated and fired and perhaps created something inside of uh of his deteriorating mind that made him hear what I was saying. But uh, the last thing I ever did with my dad was sitting by his bedside and he was gone within a couple of days of that. We played Pebble again. We played all 18 holes. And I walked uh, him through the, the golf course as if I was doing commentary. And um, he shot 72, by the way, which was pretty cool. He never shot 72 in his life. At best, he was an eight handicap in his in his uh, very best days of of playing. He was a long ball hitter, but uh, was well. I got that from him. Can't keep it in the fairway. But I had him make eighteen pars, and it, it took me. Uh, I'm not kidding you. It probably took me two hours to walk him through. I was just trying to keep him awake and see. Sure. His eyes were open, and um, I walked him through. We played pebble. It's the last thing that I ever talked to my dad about where he was awake. We played pebble. A virtual round that's special listen um let me let me let you go on this nance Tradamus, give me somebody that you're thinking about before you and tommy spencer start <laughs> you know putting your your skull caps on and, and and digging in on numbers and everything give me somebody you, your intuition tells me or tells you is going to be hanging around come sunday in a couple of weeks we we, we mentioned earlier about how I get asked during the basketball tournament oh, yeah. masters. So I've been asked to pick a winner and I want to be consistent because <laughs> there are going to be people that are going to hear this pod and say, well, that's not what he said to me when he was in Greenville, South Carolina, the first week of the tournament. <laughs> um, my, my sleeper pick Gary has been Scotty Scheffler. Mm. I, I just think he's got a big game and I see a fearlessness in him. It's not too big for him. And we know he's won twice already in the calendar year. Uh, you could say the same thing. Cam Smith won a couple of times, including uh, Kapalua and the players. 
But there's something about Scotty Scheffler, the way he carries himself. I, I think he's a, a major champion in the making. And maybe that's the week. You know it as well as I do. Trying to forecast, trying to pick a major champion, a ship, who's going to win it. You know, even when Tiger was in his prime, it, you know, when, when he had the Tiger slam, you couldn't just go in and say, well, he's going to win it. You know, it, it, there were always other candidates that were capable, you thought, at least handicapping it going in. So it's hard to say. I, I, I think it'll be someone in their 20s. I know that's not going way out on a limb, but 10 years ago, that would have been. The game now is just is just so packed with 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 great young talent. And and they all seem to be fearless, whether it's a Victor Hovland or, you know, I think Justin Thomas is going to win the Masters. One sure. of days. Maybe it's this year. He's 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 playing great. He just hasn't won. Uh, and he and Victor are tracking the right way. Cantley, you know, he had a six. He had a lead through 69 holes a few years ago. The year Tiger won. Uh, in 19 um and he's got a beautiful game that looks stylistically like a like a master's champion maybe of yesteryear graceful elegant all of that so i can't wait the bottom line is there's uh, dozens of candidates but if i had to go out on a limb and, and give you somebody that might, might make give you pause and say i hadn't thought of that i i will say scotty Scheffler. all right listen you got a lot going on I know how many obligations you have. I, I value the time uh, but beyond words. Uh, thank you very much, as always. I look forward to seeing you very soon. Can I tell you this? Uh, I, you get into um, this bubble of uh, the NCAA basketball tournament, and I've called nine games in the last nine days, and I've got the regionals in the final four coming up. And it feels like uh, it's – and this is not a complaint. This is a gift. But you're, you're just constantly, we're going to hang up here. I'm going to get on the phone here with Gonzaga and Texas Tech. And you, you constantly feel like you've got more you got to read. I, I don't, I'm not comfortable unless I feel like I've fully oh, yeah. pre prepared and seen everything. So to take a little break and know that it's just right there. It's just, a, it's in the very near future. And to sit and talk with someone who loves the game like I do, it, 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 this has been a great diversion. This has been, this has been a lot of fun been a wonderful recess for me. Now I got to go back to school, but thank you for uh, this time. It's been glorious and I, I can't, I can't thank you enough. I wouldn't want to share it with anyone else. I'll see you soon. I look forward to it, my man. All the best, Gary. Really appreciate okay. it, Val. You're terrific. Really appreciate Jim Nance. He said he only needs the grill room. See, that's what you need. You need like a whole afternoon uh, with Jim Nance in a grill room, because I think you know, a couple of questions, and then he just, he gets wafted away in this romantic haze talking about something that he genuinely loves. Uh, and again, with respect to the Masters, he is the soundtrack of my life in, in that golf tournament, and it's true of so many other people. And I appreciate him taking the time during a, a period of the year where he's got a lot going on, certainly with uh, the regionals and then the Final Four then on to Augusta National. Speaking of on to Augusta National, next week on my Five Clubs conversation, Harold Varner is going to join me right here in studio. He will be playing in his first Masters this year. He got a uh, got an, He's going to get the invitation because he is well inside the top 50. Uh, secured that with the tie for six at the Players Championship. And Harold is got a lot to say. And he's one of the most pleasant guys uh, you can imagine. So Harold Varner next week in studio right here. So thanks to Jim. Most importantly, thanks to everybody out there for listening to this Five Clubs Conversation. Mm -hmm.